Billy and Sally climbed trees together. They threw snowballs at each other. They ate each other's hair. They fought and they fussed and they fumed. They spent lots of time together. And then suddenly one day something beautiful happened and it changed their outlook each on the other completely. They fell in love. Brethren and sisters, it is possible to have spent a lot of time with Christ and even having done many things together, but still something is missing. We have not yet fallen in love. How do you learn to love? Learning to love Christ is after all at the very heart of all Christianity. I dare say there's not a person here today who would not raise her hand and say, yes, I want to love Christ more. Would you open your Bible to the book of 1 John, way in the back of the Bible, a little bit before Revelation, the book of 1 John. fourth chapter and the 19th verse and we're going to kind of dissect this text like the students in the biology lab do with their frogs sometimes let's kind of cut it apart and look at its component parts a short verse first john the fourth chapter and the 19th verse we love him because he first loved us that's our central thought for today. We love because he first loved. Let's begin with the first two words, we love. Love is the basis, of course, of all Christianity. Now we do need to ask ourselves as Christians the question, am I serving the Lord? Because the Lord has a place for each one of us to serve in his ministry. But I'm not asking you today if you serve him, but a much more basic question, do you love him? It is possible to serve Christ without really loving him for the sake of duty. Beautiful young girl is chased by an ugly old dominating man who offers her silk and servants, and she marries him. Is she his now? Legally, yes. But she did not really choose him. She chose what he could give her. It is possible for us to follow Christ and even accept marriage to Christ because of what we believe Christ can give us. But the question today is, do you love him? For three years, Peter followed Jesus. And then after three years, after Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus asked him in John 21, Peter, do you love me? After three years of being together love you I have walked by your side I have slept by your side for three years I have left a fishing business I am in the ministry with you Lord I have worked miracles in your name I believe in you but this was not the question Peter do you love me? And three times Jesus asked that same question, and so it must have been an important question. 
Is it possible that you or I might have served the Lord lo these many years and not yet really have learned to love him very much? Peter did. And just as certainly as the Lord came to Peter, he comes to your seat and he asks you today, do you love me? Lord, I would lose my job for you. And just like Amenity was saying before she sang the song today, Lord, I'd go to jail for you. I would be tortured. I would even lose my life for you. I would do anything for you, Lord. But do you love me? Love, you see, is other-centeredness. There are two poles in the moral world, self-centeredness and other-centeredness. And if we serve Christ for what self can get out of it, we cannot be serving him out of love. Who wants to go to that hot place when he dies anyway? Who would consciously opt for eternal death? Surely anything is better than that. Lord, I will serve you. But fear does not help me love him. Love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. That's from Desire of Ages, page 3. Love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. That's the reason why so many Seventh-day Adventist young people can grow up in a Seventh-day Adventist home and attend a Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath school and church and go to a Seventh-day Adventist church school and go on to live in a Seventh-day Adventist dormitory and wind up not loving Christ. Because you can make a child go to worship, but you cannot command a child to love Christ. You can make a person act in a loving type of way, but you cannot command a person to love Christ. And the problem with many of us as highly respectable church-going Seventh-day Adventists, it's so difficult for, for a person who has been taught to act lovingly to understand that he doesn't love. Because everybody who believes in love would like to think that he is able to love. And brother and sister, it ain't necessarily so. Back to our text. We love him because he first loved us. Let me put three of those words together. We love because. Human love loves because. Natural love has to have a reason for loving. And love that needs a reason is very imperfect love. Actually, our attitudes toward other people tend to be quite a direct reflection of what we think their attitudes are toward us, right? I find it quite easy to love the people that I think love me. I even have the greatest respect for the judgment of people who think that I am a good person. Anybody that can think that clearly just can't be that wrong about very many things. That our love tends very much to be a reflection of how another person treats us. Didn't you think once that you were madly in love with somebody who decided that they weren't in love with you? And when they stopped treating you lovingly, you decided that maybe after all, they weren't all that lovable. Human beings have a strong tendency to love because. We have to have a reason for loving. And that's what our text says. We love because. Now, Christ, on the other hand, loves us not because of what we are, but because of what he is. Christ loves us because he is love. 1 John 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, 
for God is love. Beautiful text over just a few pages. Just turn forward a couple of pages over to Revelation. Revelation, the first chapter. Revelation chapter 1, the fifth verse, Revelation 1 verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Some manuscripts suggest loosed us from our sins or freed us from our sins but the Jerusalem Bible agrees with the King James which is what I read and then I think it's so much more dramatic unto him that loved us and washed us take a very very careful look at the order of that verse which does Christ do first love us or wash us. Christ loves us first and he washes us only because he already loved us. Now I don't know about your kids but our seven when they were small and now we have a lot to do with our grandchildren. Often when they would get through with a meal you could just tell what they had for dinner without ever looking at the plate, right? You look at their face, there's like a whole menu written there. <laughs> if it wasn't on the face, it was on the, in the hair, it was on the hands, maybe all the way up to the elbow. Dinner's over, and Daddy gets up from the table and Baby reaches out his hands. Now what do you do? You love the little rascal. You should really rather that he was clean before you picked him up with your white shirt on. He might get me dirty. Well, that's not the way that Jesus loves. Oh, how mixed up to presume that I've got to get cleaned up before he will accept me. Look at the story of the prodigal son. We're not going to turn to it, but in Luke 15, verse 20, it talks about the reunion between the son and the father. And of course, the son had reached such a horrible state that he was feeding the pigs and wishing that he could eat their food. And he must have been extremely dirty, extremely smelly, old filthy clothes on. And Luke 15 verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Is that what you would have done? I don't know. I might have said, you know, get yourself cleaned up. We'll get you some clean clothes and then we'll talk. That's not the way that Jesus loved. Oh, how mixed up to presume that I've got to get cleaned up before he will accept me. Our text says that he loved us and washed us from our sins. He loved us when we were dirty and he washed us because he already loved us. I would like to suggest today four rungs on the ladder to perfect love. We've been saying that Christ has a perfect love. But human love loves because of. How do you go from where we are by nature to where Christ is? And as we look for a few moments at these four rungs on the ladder leading to perfect love, I want you to ask yourself a very personal and a very significant question. Which rung am I standing on today? I would hope that there is not one person here but that has walked at least up to that first rung of the ladder. Which rung of the ladder do you stand on today? Four rungs on the ladder to perfect love. Rung number one is to realize that God loves you. We love him because he 
first loved us. He loved us and He washed us. He loves you just as you are. You cannot make God stop loving you. It's His nature. He loves you no matter what. The skeptic stood up before the audience in the park and he said, there is no God and I can prove it. If there is a God, I dare you to strike me dead in five minutes. The crowd hushed. Such blatant blasphemy. God, I dare you to prove that you exist. Strike me dead five minutes. And he took out his watch and the seconds began to tick. One minute, two minutes, three, four, five minutes. Nothing happened. Ladies and gentlemen, proof positive, there is no God. Whereupon a little old lady pushed her way through the crowd and she said, sir, may I ask you a question? If your son handed you a butcher knife and he challenged you to prove your strength by plunging that knife into his body, would you do it? Well, of course not. Don't be silly. I love my children. Of course you do, she said. And that's exactly the way God feels about you. He loves you. And so realize rung number one that he loves you whether you love him or not. He loves you just as you are. First comes love and then comes loveliness. The book Mount of Blessings page 39. He does not ask us if we are worthy of his love but he gives us his love to make us what? He gives us his love to make us worthy. And so the first rung of the ladder is to realize and accept the fact that Christ loves you warts and all. He accepts you without any recommendation whatsoever. You are loved. One of the things that I enjoy about a wedding is that all weddings are presided over by beautiful brides. Now I've known some relatively plain girls that got married, but I've never known a plain bride. Even the most haphazard, misshapen, awkward, plain girl is beautiful as a bride. Why is it because of the dress and the flowers and all the other amenities? That's certainly part of it. But the main reason? Because when we know that we are loved, it makes us lovely. It makes us glow. And so God loves us misshapen, sin-scarred and all. And it's loving us just as we are that makes us beautiful. And the problem with so many commandment-keeping Christians is that they're so disgustingly respectable, they have a strong tendency to think that they've done something worth being loved for. And when you think that you deserve to be loved, the heart goes out of your entire Christian experience. The joy doesn't come into Christianity until you realize that God is treating you so much differently from the way you deserve to be treated. And when you think that you deserve God, You neither deserve him nor know him. And so the first rung is to accept the fact that God loves you as you are without recommendation. You cannot do anything to make God stop loving you. And you cannot, dear Seventh-day Adventist Christian, ever do one thing to make God love you any more than He loves you right now. And God does not love you any more than He does the drunk down in the gutter. Until we begin with that basic theology, we will never appreciate and love God for who He is. Because God is love. 
Wrong number two. Very closely associated, we let this undeserved love waken within us a love for Him. Realizing that we don't deserve love, and yet we are loved, love begets love. And there begins to be a new understanding of what God is. You see, this is a basic difference between the pagan and the Christian. The pagan and the Christian both worship, but the pagan worships to keep his God from doing something bad to him, or he needs to do something in order to win the favor of the gods, to appease the gods, or to please the gods. But the Christian worships because God has already done something good for him. God loves him. God accepts him. First of all, we accept God's love just as we are. Secondly, this begins to fill our hearts with love for God, who has treated us so differently from what we deserve. We love him because he first loved us. Now, thirdly, the love started with God. God's loving us. And now we have reciprocated. We love God back. And so now step number three. We love our brethren. 1 John 4 verse 21. Back to 1 John chapter 4. Sorry, I'm dealing with some allergy issues today. All these monsoons <laughs> made all the weeds grow. And now my nose wants to run like the washes. <laughs> First John 4, verse 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. We're not at the top yet. But we love our Christian brethren because we love the Christ that's in them. There's a law, you know, in mathematics that things equal to the same thing are equal to one another. You ever had to memorize that? called the transitive property. You know, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So I don't know. I think we got a lot of oak up here, so I'm going to use this as my example. But let's say that the big table in the back is made out of the same kind of wood as this lectern. And let's say that this table here that we use for communion is made out of the same kind of wood as this lectern. Then that means that both of these tables are made out of the same kind of wood by the transitive property. <coughs> Excuse me. The pulpit represents Christ. The tables represent two brethren in the church. And this man's acceptance and this man's acceptance and indwelling of Christ make those two men a great deal alike. They have a tremendous thing in common. They share a mutual love for Christ. We see that, I uh, like the, the whole illustration of the pyramid, you know, the triangle, where a husband and a wife, and then you have Christ up here, thank you, and the closer the husband and the wife each get to Christ, the closer they get to each other. That's God's perfect prescription for a happy marriage. They get closer and closer to each other as they get closer and closer to Christ. And so now we come to the fourth step, the most difficult step. First of all, Christ loves us no matter what. This no matter what is especially the thing that makes us love him. And when we love him, then it's easy for us to love him, the good, the Christ in our fellow man, in our fellow Christian. Now, brethren, some of us are just simply stuck on the third rung of that ladder. We enjoy Christian fellowship. 
We enjoy meeting together. We enjoy studying together. We enjoy hearing God's word. We enjoy singing together. We enjoy praying together. We enjoy eating together. We love to fellowship together. We enjoy loving relationships. We share a love for Christ. And so we love each other. But that isn't where the Lord wants to leave us at all. The fourth rung of the ladder is that next we love the unlovely because that's how he loves us. You know, it's not so difficult being on that third rung of the ladder, loving the people who think like me or might agree with me or might love Christ as I love Christ. The final test of love is whether we are able to love the unlovely. And what is it that makes us love the unlovely? Because Christ loved me that way. If Christ loved me, the unlovely, the sinful me, then as I become like Christ, I will surely learn to love the unlovely too. Now turn from 1 John to John's Gospel, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. John chapter 15. Gospel of John chapter 15. The 12th verse. Maybe you never thought of this verse in this light before. John the 15th chapter, the 12th verse. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, he's saying more than just, I loved you, and so you should love everybody else. It says more than that. It says that I loved you in a certain way. I loved you in an undeserving way, and you ought to love others in an undeserving way. Look at it again, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That is in the same way that I have loved you. And verse 13 of that chapter shows us what kind of love that he's speaking about here. Verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And often we think about martyrdom. We think about being able to take the place of somebody and die in their place. But I think this means more also. What does it mean to lay down your life for your friends? It means to lay down your way of living, lay down your priorities, to put the other person first, to lay down your life, what you think is important in your life, and to look at it from the perspective of a brother or a sister, and to lay down your life for their sake. That you love one another as I have loved you. In the same way that I have loved you. Our natural tendency is that if you'll just stop, stop talking about me and dragging my name in the dirt. If you'll just start being nice to me, treating me with respect. If you would just make a dozen changes, then I could love him. I believe, Brother Spooner, that I could love my wife if she'd only make some changes in the way that she treats me. Or he needs to change some serious flaws in his character before I can love him. There's not very much Christianity in that. If you can't love a person, it isn't because he's bad, it's because your love is bad. And when you're unable to love a person, it's a much greater condemnation of your Christianity than it is of his character. We need to stop excusing our lack of love toward others on the fact that there are just bad people out there. The problem is we've got bad love in us. Let me suggest a simple test for love. The way to really test your Christian love is how you feel toward the person that you think is the most unlovely person that you know. 
how do you really feel toward the most unlovely person that you know? And when you're able to answer that, you'll know something about which rung of the ladder you're standing on. And so let's put it all together. How can I turn my life around? How can I turn my life into a truly love-centered life? That's what we all want. We want it so much that we pretend we have it. We fake it. But way down deep, we know we've not really learned to love as we ought. How does it happen? Four rungs on the ladder leading to perfect love. First of all, I accept Christ's loving me when I have done nothing to deserve it. Secondly, this makes me love the one that treats me so much better than I deserve. I love because he first loved me. And then thirdly, the third rhyme. Since I now love Christ, I find it quite easy and natural to love other people that love Christ. Because the Christ in me and the Christ in them reach out in unity to one another. But step four is that now I am able to love even the unlovely because that's the way Jesus loves me. Some years ago, a little girl came down sick, very sick. Matter of fact, they quarantined her. She was highly contagious. And she had a very close girlfriend. But of course, they couldn't see each other. Days went by, weeks went by, and the little sick girl never heard a single thing from her friend. When finally she started to get well and they could be together again, she was really pretty aggravated when she met her friend. She said, you could at least have sent me a little note or something. Oh, but I did. I sent you something in love every single day that you were sick. And we were apart. Well, I never got it once. Oh, said the friend, I sent it to you through somebody else. I guess they just kept it for themselves. There's not a single heart in this congregation today that has received and received and received love from our Lord. But how many of us are really passing it on? How many of us have taken and taken and taken Christ's love and we're depriving people in our own families of love? We've taken and taken and taken Christ's love and we neglect others in our church family. How about those that aren't here today? We've taken and taken and taken Christ's love and we're letting people in our community go loveless all through the year because we take and we take and we don't pass it on. Is there somebody that God wants to love through you? Maybe somebody that you found too unlovely to go very far out of your way to love. As we close our service today, will you ask the Lord, which rung of the ladder do I stand on? Lord, whom have you wanted to love through me? Our closing hymn, open my eyes that I may see.